Hi, I'm Tara Kozlov, and it is my great pleasure to introduce uh, my dear friend, uh, former FCC Commissioner Pamela Jones Harbor. Hello. So, Pam, we're going to have fun with this, aren't we? <laughs> right. um, I thought it would be fun to start by telling everybody who's watching this where we just came from before we came here to the studio. So, okay. where were we? Well, we were at the chair showcase, and uh, we were fortunate enough to have uh, the chair, Alan Van Fleet, have a special program that was based upon the joint article that we wrote together, uh, Section 2 in a Web 2.0 World, an expanded look at uh, relevant product markets. So I thought it would be fun to go back in that story and talk about where that article came from um, as part of our experience as being uh, a commissioner and an attorney advisor for your entire term. So um, let, let's talk about the birth of that article. The, the article, uh, actually the birth of it happened hearkening back to 2007 uh, uh, with the Google double click uh, uh, merger that was before the FTC. Uh, I think I knew uh, after a number of parties had come into the FTC with white papers and uh, just a vast amount. I know we had a stack of white papers and, and all these sort of um, uh, substantive uh, articles to help us. And, and I knew that I was, I was going to uh, dissent. And, and I recall that when, when we were looking at this merger, uh, we, I started to see some synergies between the competition issues and the consumer protection issues. And so I had asked uh, the managers if they could bring together the consumer protection folks because we really saw some strong privacy aspects there with the competition folks because the two sides of the agency didn't always talk to each other and, and probably not very often at all with respect to cases. So I recall I had said, Tara, you know, we need to have a meeting calling the two sides together and you did that very dutifully and, and so, you know, the BCP was there, the privacy folks and the competition folks. and. And I think while I was in the room, they talked to each other, but once I left, they stopped. <laughs> I also kind of remember, we had asked them before, we had, we had asked, you guys have spoken, right? And they kept telling us, oh yeah, we're yeah, talking yeah, all yeah, the time. But then I remember we got into that room and somebody said something like, you know, just, just to be on the safe side, we should go around the room and everybody should introduce themselves. And it, it became very clear to me that there were people in that room who had really never met each other That's before. Right. So what I had hoped would happen where the privacy folks would sort of school the competition folks and the competition folks would help the privacy folks frame it, it didn't happen. So, you know, I was thinking, boy, you know, there's a big fat dissent coming because I, I, really, I really felt very strongly about it after having done a lot of the, inter, um, you're just looking very carefully at the, at the white papers. And so uh, I remember that, you know, maybe we had a couple of weeks to actually craft a dissent and staff had had, you know, a year or so to, to look at it. And that was what was very tricky about being a commissioner. I mean, when you dissent, you know, you have to be very substantive. And so you don't have as much time as you would like and you have to formulate your arguments. So I remember putting together an outline and, and it was rather lengthy and it was sort of all over the place. It was about 14 pages but generally when I would put together an outline of my thoughts I, I hand it to Tara and something comes back that's very brilliant. So I handed the 14 page outline on how I thought the dissent would be shaped and, and, and gave it to you and what do you recall? <laughs> um, I recall that I struggled with it exactly. and was having a little trouble distilling where we were going with it. That's right. So I, I remember that um, I got it back at about 11 o'clock uh, at night and this was, and I remember this vividly because it was right around the holidays and the White House was having its holiday visit to the White House and I worked most of the week in Washington and on Fridays I would work from the FTC's regional office. My family was on the New York side and, and so I had promised my, my daughter Alexandra that she could go to the White House Christmas with me that year. So she had told her entire class, her school, so she, you know, this was the day before the White House Christmas. So I get back the, the dissent that uh, you had drafted from my 14 pages and um, you know, it was not ready for prime time. So it's 11 o'clock at night, you know, I had to be up at you know, 5 to catch the train, and I'm thinking, okay. So I, I remember thinking this was really, uh, you know, going to be um, 
this was going to either do or die. I remember going into my office at 11 and working on that until about 2 a.m. And I remember I turned it over at 2. I think you picked it up at 5. Right. I got on the train with my so daughter. The scary thing is how typical this was <laughs> that we were working at these crazy hours, which yeah. is a whole other subject. We'll, we'll get to that. So yeah. I, you know, you picked it up at 5. I got on that train, and by, you know, 10 o'clock, you know, it came back, and, and, and it was, uh, I was pleased with it, very, very pleased. And um, I remember at the time, you know, we shared it with the others, and, and one of the, uh, you know, one of the managers had said to me, they called up, and uh, they, weren't as, they weren't that pleased with me dissenting, uh, and said, you know, what makes you, uh, Commissioner Harbor, think that you know better than any of us? you know, on this descent. What makes you think that you're right on this? And, you know, they said, you know, the economists don't agree with you, the managers don't agree with you. You know, why are you right here? And I said, you know, I don't know whether I'm right, but I feel so strongly about this descent that I'm gonna, you know, stick my neck out and put my, you know, put my reputation on the line for it and I'm willing to do that. And and, and there was the Google double click descent. And, and in that dissent, there were two big concepts that we had teed up. We had teed up that privacy was a non-price dimension of competition law and should have been considered in the deal. Uh, and that was a very new concept, and I guess it's still new, not quite as new. And then the other concept was that consumer data can form the basis of a relevant antitrust product market. And so from th those concepts, there were other things in the, uh, in the dissent as well, but from that, uh, we, we drafted an article together, and Alan Van Fleet, uh, chair of the uh, antitrust section, read the article when he was on a, a long plane trip and decided to make that the centerpiece of his chair showcase. So that is a very long answer to your question, where did I come from and today? It's, and it's been pretty fun for us. It's, it's been a crazy few months, but it was really rewarding today to actually see it all happen yes. so, after all that time. Yeah, very much so. So. Um, so just by way of context, um, I think a big part of why you asked me to do your interview is because I served as your advisor for your entire term as a commissioner, um, which was a huge privilege in my life and in my career. Um, but obviously you had quite a stellar career even you, before you got to the commission, which is what got you there in the first place. Um, and I know in talking to some of our mutual friends and some of your former colleagues, um, your experience as a state enforcer was uh, a theme that, that came up again and again, and, and many people thought it was really important for us to capture some of that during this interview. So, um, so I think I'm going to actually take you back back okay. to the very beginning Good of your career point. and um, and talk about some of the highlights of, of um, what you did as a state enforcer in New York and, and what you recall as some of your biggest accomplishments there. Well, I, I remember when uh, my very first day uh, in the AG's office, and I really wasn't there uh, in the Antitrust Bureau. I actually came in as Deputy Bureau Chief of Legal Training, Recruitment, and Development. It was a manager's job, but I was a baby lawyer two years out of uh, law school, and I was hiring uh, uh, folks uh, for Robert Abrams uh, Attorney General office in, in New York State. And it, it I, I, I took the position because I wanted to be in New York City. I had come from Albany, and that was you know my dream to Don't practice. Don't you explain that to me? Okay, all right. So we'll <laughs> jump over that. So I'll back I, you up I, on that. I, whatever, I, whatever it takes to get to New York. I, yeah. I took the job thinking, okay, you know, I, I am in administrative law, and I'm just two years out of law school, and this is not exactly you know what I want to be doing. I want more substantive work, but you know what? If I go to the New York AG's office and I really prove myself, then maybe I can maneuver my way into another bureau. So that was the, that was the game plan. So, you know, I'm interviewing, you know, people with these amazing careers to come to Robert Abrams uh, office and, you know, I've been out of law school two years. It didn't feel right. So my, my strategy was to look around the New York AG's office and see what bureaus that Bob Abrams held in the highest esteem, and really he held all of them in the highest esteem because he had a wonderful office. But there was one bureau that was just sparkling, and it was the Antitrust Bureau. And um, I remember, you know, I remember thinking, well, you know, I'm not, I don't really have a background in antitrust. Let me volunteer uh, to work on one of the cases, and you know, maybe if I work hard and impress them, they'll let me come to the bureau. And and that's what I did. It was one of the milk cases, and it was a commerce clause case, and you know I did some work, and and then um, 
uh, Lloyd Constantine uh, asked me to join the Bureau. So my first day in the Bureau, oh, and I basically said to my current uh, boss, Richard Weinberg, who's now a judge, uh, I said, well, you know, I, I really want to do cases. And, and he was great. He understood, and he let me go, and there was no problem there at all. So, so the you're, you're yet one of many accidental antitrust lawyers. Exactly. There's so many of us who yes. didn't think we were going to be antitrust lawyers. And then, and, and, yeah. and so my, my first day in the uh, New York State uh, AG's Antitrust Bureau, I get handed two cases. Uh, I can't remember the first one, but the second one, it involved the cable television industry. And, uh, you know, I was told, here's your case, investigate it, you know, there's something probably going on here, see what you can do. So it, I'm looking at this case and, and, you know, like a good young lawyer, I started digging into the facts. And, uh, you know, now I hear lawyers talk about, oh, you know, document review, I really can't stand docu re document review. I, I really enjoy document review. You're in a room, all these boxes, and, and you the know, truth is in there somewhere. It, it is, yeah. and you know, we pass the time by finding the hot documents. You tell a body joke now and then. I mean, I enjoyed document review because she who knows the facts knows the case. And this was, I know I'm dating myself, but I have to say it. This was before the internet, this was before computers. We had did we even have a computer in the AG's office? And I think we had one computer in the middle of the office. I didn't go near it. I think two people went near it. Bob Hubbard was somebody on it, and I think Gary Malone. Well, we know, we know you and computers are not necessarily friends, so well, maybe you know, it's a good we thing become, that you didn't go near exactly, it. We became more friendly. But you know, most of us were not using computers then. There was no email. There were typing. So I put the case together with index cards. You know, I did it in chronological order. And basically, after going through thousands of boxes, you know, put together and discovered that the cable operators were trying to thwart this new technology that they called Death Star. And, you know, they took up the orbital positions to keep, you know, the, the new technology from coming to the market. The new technology was direct broadcast satellite, DBS. And I remember traveling to uh, the Midwest and uh, talking to the inventor of DBS. It was Charlie Ergen, and he you know, held up this small dish and he shook it at me and he said, this is going to revolutionize the way we receive a signal. And he's right. But had the cable operators been successful and kept Death Star out of the market, then we wouldn't have ushered in uh, DBS. And so, you know, the case as the baby lawyer, the factual case I put together, uh, you know, turned it over to Joe Opper, did some research, worked with him. And now, was that, was that a multi-state case or was oh. it just a... New York case? Uh, well, it started off as a New York case, but once we put together the facts and then we got our complaint together, then I went out and got 45 states on board. And it ended up being a, uh, a consent decree with 45 states, and we opened up the markets and ushered in this new direct broadcast satellite uh, technology. So and how typical was that for a, a lawyer that junior to be shepherding a multi-state case? Well, you don't think about it being atypical, but it, it, it was what it was, and I remember that, um, you know, I was really a young lawyer then, and uh, uh, when we would have our meetings, there would be probably 15 or more partners in the room. I'm not sure if Jim Real was on this case. He was on another one, but I mean, you know, two years out of law school, and these very senior and very accomplished uh, partners were on the room and in the room, and I remember that toward the end of the case, Maybe not the end. I remember that I, I was expecting my, my first daughter, and, and, uh, and as I was going out uh, on maternity leave, you know, they were nice, and they said, so what are you going to name her? And I said, Prime Star, because that was the name <laughs> of her. <laughs> anyway, I've it was, never heard it was, that one before. Yeah, yeah. So, so it, was, it was a very nice memory. So did that case um, shape your perspective on the, the value of multi-state enforcement? Because oh. I know that was a, a huge theme for you has been a huge theme for you. Absolutely. In fact, the next big multi-state case dealt with the resale price maintenance issues. Uh, and uh, back, uh, I guess, in the late 80s and early 90s, uh, the states were looking at some of the shoe manufacturers with price fixing. And um, I probably had been in the Bureau uh, maybe about six years by now. Uh, and uh, this was the Reebok case, and we had alleged that uh, there was price fixing with their with their uh, athletic shoes, 
and I happened to lead this one. And what was so much uh, fun about this case was that um, you know, I and we were able to get 53 states on board. And, you know, those extra three, I think we had Guam in there and, you know, other sort of commonwealths. And, uh, and it was appealed, and actually I had the uh, honor of arguing in the Second Circuit Court of Appeals on behalf of 53 state attorneys general. And, you know, by then, you know, I was really hooked on the multi-state process because each state AG's office might not have a full contingent of lawyers to to litigate against the private uh, you know the private bar but in the aggregate you know you really have a lot of leverage a lot of power and with 53 states coming in and arguing it, it was it was really powerful and, and and we did win that one and and that was when I was sold on the multi-state process. And I assume your success in that case led in part to the big role that you played in um, state oil Con. Uh, later on in your career. Uh, th that is true. Now, of course, the result was not as victorious in state oil versus con, uh, and where the states basically argued uh, in the United States Supreme Court for the court to retain the per se rule with, with respect to all forms of uh, uh, price fixing. Uh, and, and so uh, I was thinking about uh, Justice uh, Scalia today when he was uh, reading his new book and going through some of the new book uh, at uh, the, uh, one of the, one of the uh, programs. And I recall when I had the honor of arguing in the Supreme Court that, you know, I stood up to the lectern and boy, that was an intense, talk about scary. And I bet you, and I bet you remember exactly what you were wearing. Oh, I absolutely <laughs> do. And you know, Molly Boast, if you are out there, uh, Molly had argued in the, in the Supreme Court, and she was my, you know, my idol and a woman who had actually been there in the Supreme Court. So, of course, you know the natural question that I'm going to ask Molly Bose. said, Molly, what did you wear? <laughs> uh, and so she said, I got myself a really, really nice suit. So that, you know, and I said, okay, I, 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 can, I can deal with that. So... I do remember what I, what I, and it's in the back of the closet, nostalgic. But as I was at the lectern, I remember, um, I remember that Justice Scalia was not enamored with uh, my position, the state's position. And he had said something to the effect of, you know, uh, I, just, I just don't agree with this theory at all and he made no bones about it and said something about you know you know is this an even viable theory <laughs> and so I you know I believe so strongly in the position you know and 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 I could hear my my husband who was in there like because <gasps> Justice Scalia was coming after right. me you know so, you know, I remember like looking up and thinking about it a long time because, you know, I'm sparring with Justice Scalia. We know who's going to come out ahead there. So I said, well, I said, obviously, I think it's a viable position, but 37 state attorneys general agree with me as well. And, you know, it's about the best you're going to do. That's right. That and, so, and, then, and then I also remembered that, you know, he uh, was going down a line of questioning and then um, Justice Sandra uh, Day O'Connor said, "Miss Harbor, you know, you had said X, Y, Z, so the justices can kind of s help you with your argument. And I felt that she was trying to get me back to my argument because, uh, you know, one of the other justices was sort of taking me down his path. And I, I had a feeling that she did that, you know, just trying to, to help you out a little exactly, bit. Exactly, exactly. But, you know, all in all, uh, I think the state's, uh, the position then was, we didn't want the per se rule to be uh, overruled uh, with uh, respect to horizontal and with respect, um, yes, with respect to horizontal and thought that perhaps in 10 years it would be and almost 10 years to the day it was in Legion. And so that was the objective then to sort of preserve the per se rule for horizontal. Uh, so do you want, you want to talk about Legion now or you want to, you want to finish up on states and talk about Legion in a little while. Uh, well, I think uh, I think that's uh, pretty good with the states. Um, I, I like the cooperative uh, nature of the states and the federal government. I know the Department of Justice is very cooperative with states. The FTC always has been, so that's very good to have 
you know, a cooperative relationship between the, the federal enforcers and the state enforcers. So. I, I, and I felt like on. as a commissioner that was a theme that really came through often. I remember at every commission meeting you always were sure to ask, and, and where are the state AGs on this case? Are we talking to them? Are they involved? Yeah, it's yeah. true. Very true. So I know when I first met you and started to get to uh, know your agenda and your plans as a commissioner, the RPM issues were always high on your list, and, and I guess fortunately or unfortunately during your term we had um, the fact that the Legion case came up to the Supreme Court. Um, which gave us lots of opportunity for advocacy. So I thought maybe we'd talk about that a little bit. Okay. Well, and, you know, some of the most interesting stories are the backstories. Uh, and um, lots of good backstories. Yes. That, and, you yeah. know, we knew it was coming up uh, and would be argued. And um, I was interested in, in, in a brief, but learned that, you know, commissioners can't uh, submit their own briefs. You have to, you know, be part of the Solicitor General's brief. So. I knew the commission would probably take a contrary view uh, than I and, and I, and I wondered what sort of vehicle that I could use to articulate my views. And that's when, you know, we kind of got together and thought about it and talked about it. And I know uh, Laurel was very instrumental, Laurel Price, uh, one of my other advisors. And we decided an open letter to the Supreme Court. And it's like, yes! Now, an open letter masquerading as a brief. I'm, you know, I'll be honest, you know, it, it, but, but it was not sent, so it wasn't an ex parte communication. It was written and posted. We just posted, posted it. <laughs> it. It evoked a firestorm. In fact, do you recall that an anonymous uh, letter came in or request for the inspector general to yes. investigate me? Yes. I think you I was. You. I'm like, come, yeah. come get me. You know, I, I don't know what happened. Yeah. We didn't do anything wrong, but... Um, uh, but uh, that was um, that was a uh, a real collaborative effort, and you know it sort of brings to mind the way we as an office operated, and you know what the I, Borg the Borg and you know let me explain that I mean there were times on a few matters I would say the matters that probably had the most uh, resonance and and uh, impact that we would get together as an office, sit in my office, and just sort of mind meld. You know, we'd finish each other's sentences, and we would do that sort of collective thing. And the open letter was definitely uh, one, of those, uh, one of those times. And I think I was very, very pleased uh, with the outcome of, of, that, uh, of that effort. Well, it was interesting because in the end, it didn't necessarily impact the outcome in the Supreme Court. Um, in terms of the ruling, but we're, we're pretty sure that the, the justice who wrote the dissenting opinion read it. You know, you never know for sure, but it certainly... Well, we had sitting similar through arguments. The, sitting through the oral argument and reading the dissenting opinion, it, it certainly did seem as though, as though it, uh, he had read it. So that was, uh, that was a real memorable uh, project that yeah. we had. Well, and I thought it was a really good example of the, the chemistry that we had in our office. Um, I, th I think the chemistry, especially between you and me and Laurel because the three of us were there for your entire term. That's um, right. I think we developed that chemistry with some of the consumer protection advisors over time, but That's Laurel right. and I were the ones who At were there for the whole you, term. You were the yeah. original collective, and, uh, and then when we started um, bringing in privacy and competition uh, as, you know, having synergies, then Jamie Hine became part of the collective as well. We let him into the board. <laughs> Yeah, that's true. So the open letter to the Supreme Court in Legion um, ended up kind of being the spark for your further advocacy in RPM. I mean, there were there were a couple of other things that grew out of that. Um, there was the congressional testimony that you did. That's on right. The issue. That was fun. The congressional testimony, and there was a, a workshop, a three-day workshop, uh, and um, you know, I, I think that the uh, the the jury is still open on what is going to happen uh, in that area with respect to the agencies. I know the agencies uh, haven't had RPM on their radar screen uh, of late, but uh, that could change. That could change. So we'll have to see what happens. I mean, obviously the Supreme Court has spoken, but there could be, you know, some legislation in the works. So, so I was trying to think of some of the other really big cases that we dealt with while you were there at the commission, and um, obviously we have to talk about Rambus. Yes. Since that's a huge part of your legacy as a commissioner as well, uh, having uh, drafted the commission opinion. 
Rambus was tremendously complicated, but uh, what what I you know remember most about Rambus uh, was that I, I I really wanted to try to get consensus, and and early on, uh, I guess I, I I realized that you know I certainly wouldn't get consensus in the remedy of of Rambus, but I thought perhaps we could get consensus with liability. So I remember uh, we talked about how about if we bifurcate it, if we have you know one part of the opinion dealing with liability and the other part dealing with remedy because I really believe that I could get a 5-0 on liability. And so uh, you know the commissioners would get together every few weeks and really talk for hours about Rambus and uh, we were able to get uh, consensus on liability which uh, you know, which I felt very, very pleased about. Um, you know, obviously the court uh, didn't see it our way. We were all convinced about the sort of uh, deceptive aspects of the standard setting uh, organization and how that deception uh, should be uh, part of a, you know, a section two uh, and uh, exclusionary conduct. Uh, and uh, it, was, it was a bit disappointing. Uh, I know when I first came to the uh, commission and we were looking uh, at Rambus, uh, I think it was under, uh, it was under Tim Uris as, as chair. I remember mentioning <coughs> section five, perhaps that we might look at this as a section five and they all looked at me like I had said something <laughs> terrible. I said, well, I think it would work. And you know, I was totally shot down, rather new then. So I let it go and you know, I knew I wasn't gonna win that fight. Then when um, uh, Jonathan Leibowitz came, and you know, uh, his secretary tells me I'm the only one who calls him <coughs> Jonathan. Everyone calls him John, but you know, since he's still Jonathan to me. So he, uh, he pursued a Section 5 uh, theory, and I think at the end of the day, he, he was right about that, because uh, one of the judges, you know, in the opinion, uh, uh, basically, uh, <coughs> really gave him uh, a, a good nod about Section 5 and how potentially, you know, we might have prevailed. Potentially, I'm, I'm saying. I'm not sure you would have gotten um, a commission majority on Section 5. I, I, I agree. <coughs> I agree. Oh, here goes my coughing fit. Um, I'm trying to remember some of the other big themes during your term on the competition side. Um, um, biologics <coughs> was something that uh, was of interest. I remember when I first came to the commission, uh, everyone said, what is your platform? What will your platform be? And I remember there was a lot of pressure to have a platform. I mean, by the end of my term, you know, I, there were so many issues that I was interested in. But I know that when you, when you first take your seat as a commissioner, people want to know what your platform will be. So I was always looking for a platform issue. And I remember uh, reading uh, one of the, uh, uh, the IP report and finding in a footnote <coughs> something about biologics. And you know, we could never find that footnote I know, I've after. never been able to find the uh, footnote. So I don't know where it was, but, but I read about generic biologics. And I said, and, and in the footnote it talked about how it was a controversial area and how the commission was not going to opine on it at, at, at that time. And I said, you know, I said, I'm interested in, in biologics, so why don't we get staff together, talk about it, see if there's some way that the commission can sort of advance the learning in this area. And uh, that's how uh, my office became interested in biologics and probably staff had been interested I in it. I think staff was interested yes. in it and they were working on a report, but I don't think they ever envisioned they would have a commissioner end up being their primary spokesperson. And, and so I think they were delighted so that when we met with staff and I said, I'm interested in biologics, it was like, oh, and then all this wonderful scholarship started to appear and we started to, to craft, uh, you know, um, a, a, an area of interest for mine, of, of mine. And, and um, biologics are, are, are very expensive drugs that um, are made from, from living cells. Uh, and I guess you would say a biologic could be a hormone uh, or, or um, just a, something that can help cure cancer, but very expensive. I'm, I know some biologics were as much as $450,000 uh, $450, a year for a patient. And, and there was you know, no way to bring the generic version of a biologic to the market. In fact, as the conversation uh, evolved, uh, 
the industry stopped saying generic biologics because they said you can never have a generic, not a true generic. They called them follow-on biologics. But anyway, the, the commission was interested in seeing if there was some pathway to bring those uh, new uh, pharmaceuticals to the market. Do you remember the day of the congressional hearing on that? Uh, yes, our report that was came a tough out. Day. And, uh, you know, I was the one that was tasked to, uh, to go to Congress and to defend the commission's report. Uh, I would say, you know, there were a few, uh, there were a few uh, congressmen who were in favor of our report, but the exclusivity period was, uh, you know, uh, Well, I think the problem, the problem was there were some people who thought that you should treat follow-on biologics the same as generic drugs, and we were trying to argue why the economic incentives were just going to be completely different. And the Hatch-Waxman, you know, process for, for follow-ons was not going to work, and, and, and I remember when uh, I was there, it was a very, very hostile crowd. You know. And long. That long. hearing went they were on like forever. 50 you were supposed to give another speech that yeah. day, and, and you never made it. Right. You sent me yeah. to give the speech, exactly. remember? Because yeah. it just went on forever. That was so, all right. Well, I mean, clearly competition was a, a, a huge part of, of your term as a commissioner, but I really want to make sure that I don't skip over the consumer protection side of things because you accomplished so much as a commissioner on the consumer protection side as well. Um, so we've, we've started talking a little bit about some of the privacy issues relating to the chair showcase this morning, but I, I thought we should talk about APEC a little bit because APEC is something we, we didn't really foreshadow at all when you started ah. as a commissioner and ended up being one of the, the biggest parts of your term, really. You know, that is true. Uh, and it's interesting because when you're a sitting commissioner, uh, a lot of groups want to come in and meet with you. Uh, and I guess you don't really appreciate that until after you leave and then you're on the outside plotting how to get <laughs> in and to talk to a commissioner. So, you know, I... I'm uh, sure they return your calls. Uh, they do, but yeah. I try not to, you know, abuse that. So there was a meeting that was called and lots of companies came in to talk to me about APEC. And, you know, uh, folks who come to the commission are very deferential. In fact, they were so deferential, I didn't really know what they wanted from me. And, and so, I, and I remember this, because it was uh, Marty Abrams from Hunt and Williams in the uh, Center for um, Policy and Institute, uh, CIPL. And, and, I, and I said, you know, I said, you just give me the bottom line. You know, what is it that, you know, you, you're wanting me to do here? And I said, you, I, I won't be offended. And he said, well, you know, with APAC, he says, the commission needs a seat at the table. You know, uh, companies are, 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 you know, are going around the world trying to bring, you know, this cross-border privacy rule system to the Asia-Pacific Rim, but the commission has not, you know, at a commissioner level, because staff is always dedicated and they're always interested, but sometimes if you don't have uh, a commissioner there, you know, it doesn't get the visibility and, and it's hard to push through agenda. So he was hoping that, uh, you know, one of us would be interested, and I know that they had made the rounds to all the commissioner's offices. I said, what? You know, the, there's an empty seat at the table, no one from the commission? Well, I want to go, of course. You know, but I said, invite me, because, you know, as a commissioner, we're autonomous. Now, if I were to go to the chair and say, can I go abroad and represent the minority position on this, you know, then the money may not <laughs> materialize. <laughs> materialize. So I said, if you invite me from the outside, you know, I will go because we have our own budget. So I got an invitation from, the, uh, from Australia, from the Australian government to, to represent uh, our agency uh, in, in, at the APEC summits. And um, you know, what I didn't realize was uh, they were at a real pivotal uh, point in, in, in the, the whole um, cross-border rule system. They were trying to decide what sort of approach to take with all of the economies. I think there were about 21 economies. And when I say economies, they're really countries, but I think uh, they called them economies because Chinese Taipei, you know, didn't want to mm -hmm. be called a country. So uh, we had to choose what model um, all of the economies would follow going forward. And there was only one model that worked for the United States. It was the flexible approach, meaning, you know, because we have a sectoral uh, view of privacy and approach to privacy. We don't have a data protection authority. And had the economies not chosen the right, you know, model, the U.S. They may would lose us. Yes, right. exactly. So Marty didn't tell me this. I had to persuade the 21 economies to, you know, adopt the flexible approach. And it, there's a lot of jargon with APEC, you know, um, 
ECSG, DPS, and, and so... I just remember being really amazed at how quickly you absorbed it. And I remember you saying something like, well, it doesn't move very fast, so it's pretty easy to absorb. But still, I, I mean, it, it was a lot. And well, you, you did absorb it really fast. Well, well, I, that's all relative. I mean, you know, I didn't, when I got on the plane and I saw the agenda and I saw that I was leading the, you know, the whole segment on which model will be chosen, uh, the plane ride was about 21 hours, so I, and you needed all I needed about you yeah. know 18 of them, and that's what I did. I focused really, really hard and crammed. So it, it turned out well. The flexible approach was chosen, and and actually APEC uh, is in its in its final uh, implementation stages, and I think probably within within a year that the. APEC framework will be in place, a cross-border privacy rule system will be ready to be road tested. And even now as a civilian, uh, you know, at Fulbright and Jaworski, uh, I am still part of the United States delegation and very active in APEC and it's, it's very rewarding. Do you think it would have gotten as far as it did without having a commissioner level person really pushing and involved uh, at the point where you stepped in? Uh, you know, that's hard to say, but I certainly know that the U.S.'s role was appreciated, and I don't think that the countries really appreciated how much we do with privacy. You know, they say, oh, they have a sectoral approach, they're not adequate under the EU system, but when they looked at our enforcement record, uh, when you have a commissioner there who is sort of, you know, recounting all of our uh, successes and our cases, I think then they begin to understand that, you know, the U.S. really really does enforce privacy. And well, it was tricky because so many other countries actually have a data privacy commissioner. And when they looked at the U.S. and didn't see someone who held that title, it, you could see where they might think we don't take it quite as seriously. But, but in the eyes of many people in other countries, you ended up kind of becoming the de facto privacy commissioner, right? They started inviting you to different events and things where you got your seat at the table not just at APEC, but in other places that, as that well. That is true. That is true. Um, and then it shifted over to uh, to Europe as well. Uh, so that that was. Uh, that I was think nice you're a good visit. ambassador for the U.S. I'm sure. I'm sure that had something to do with it. Well, thank you. I think so. <laughs> that actually reminds me. We should talk about um, our visit to Brussels. Going back to the Google DoubleClick issues, we didn't we didn't mention that. That's so. that's true. So the dissent came out, and um, you know it caused a bit of a firestorm because that was a real new concept then, and no one had said this. And you know that uh, dissenting and saying privacy is part of uh, the competition analysis, and that the deal should have been uh, potentially rejected because of these privacy concerns. Uh, members of the European uh, privacy community had read this, and I was invited to testify. Uh, in Parliament uh, as an expert uh, witness. And it was interesting because I ended up wearing three hats. You know, because I was coming from the United States, you know, you know you represent your country and everybody was interested in homeland security. That was an area that I didn't cover. But then also I had to represent the majority opinion, of which I was not part, and also representing my dissenting view as well. So it, it was it was a little touchy there uh, for a while, but I, I think it uh, I think it turned out very well. I think I was very fair in uh, you know in articulating the majority view and and why I uh, you know uh, was not in agreement. But uh, uh, that that was uh, that was quite an event. Yeah. yeah. So on the consumer protection side. Um, one other theme that I thought we might, to might want to talk about was issues relating to children. That was something that was always very important to you as a commissioner. And, and some of it was issues directly relating to children's privacy and, and children's issues online. You also had an interest in like tobacco and alcohol um, regulation and in particular how that might affect children. Uh, yes, I was very interested. And part of it, uh, selfishly, uh, at the time, uh, this was I guess right before social networking really took off, uh, you know, I had uh, tw preteens, tweens at the time, and you know they were starting to really explore the internet, and and uh, I was concerned about you know some of the some of the dangers, and didn't feel that I, you know, was equipped enough to know how to do some of the blocking software, and and I remember uh, at the time. Uh, uh, there was a real children's privacy advocate, Perry Aftab, uh, whom I met and, and later became very involved in some of her work, Wired Safety. Uh, and uh, basically she had a teen angels uh, organization and, uh, you know, I remember having uh, uh, my children uh, join that and 
she, they were trained uh, on the internet. I was there, uh, felt comfortable about letting them use it, and that sort of pulled me into some of the to the issues of uh, cyberbullying and uh, you know uh, safely navigating uh, the internet uh, for children. And uh, so I, I've been interested in those issues, obviously because of my children and because they're issues that uh, are deserving of attention. That's actually a really good segue into a less substantive but very important topic to both of us, which is the whole balancing of work and family. It's a perfect example of how you managed to craft a balance, at least on that issue, um, between uh, your role as a commissioner and your family. But as we both know, there were many, many opportunities to confront those issues. Um, going back to your White House interview for being a commissioner in the first place, um, I thought that might be a fun story to talk about. Oh, wow, yeah. Uh, let's see. Um, well, uh, when Commissioner Anthony, uh, whom you had worked for as an advisor, uh, she and I uh, used to uh, do a program every year, the Aliaba program. She was invited as a, a speaker, I was invited, and you know, over the years we, we became uh, friendly colleagues. And uh, I recall uh, when I was expecting my, uh, my third child, I was at actually the antitrust spring meeting many years ago and you know she came up to me and she said I want to may I speak with you Pamela I said oh yes Commissioner Anthony sure and I thought you know she was gonna say and what do you do and you know what does a baby need I was eight months trying not to be conspicuous it was rather <laughs> hard not to be at eight months and she said may I put your name in to you know to be interviewed for for commissioner and I you know I really thought that was amusing because here I am. I, by the way, I was a partner in a, in a New York law firm at the time. And, you know, my first thought is, hmm, I'm going to be on maternity leave for three months. If my name's in, my name will be in play. So, you know, maybe that'll score me some points with uh, my partner. So I said, yeah, yeah, sure, put it in. And I totally forgot about it because... And um, I was on uh, maternity leave. My, my daughter was five weeks old. In fact, we were uh, at a family reunion, my husband's, West Virginia, and the phone rings, my new phone. I remember that because, oh, my new phone's ringing. And it was Senator Daschle's office. And this is Senator Daschle's office. And uh, you, your name was given to us by Commissioner Anthony. And we would like to interview you for a position of Federal Trade Commissioner. I, you know, I almost dropped the phone. and so. Better the phone than the baby. You know, my first thought was, oh my gosh, you know, will my suit fit? <laughs> and so I said, uh, oh, well, uh, yeah, you know, I'm doing the whole stammering thing. I said, well, you know, I'm on maternity leave now. And they said, oh, oh, if this is not a good time, we totally understand. Of course, that meant, see, you'll never hear from us again. They were very nice about it. I said, oh, no, 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 no. And I didn't even believe I wanted it at the time. But you always, you never turn something down because I knew I was somewhat irrational then, and I'd think about it when a clearer head prevailed. I said, no, 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 uh, can, you, can, you, can you give me, um, you know, I'm in West Virginia now, can you give me um, four days? Because, you know, it was like a Wednesday, and I figured Tuesday. They said, yes, yes, we will. So, so I remember, you know, I said, we got to leave. I got to get ready for this interview. And so uh, um, I remember the day of the interview, uh, uh, you know, now she's what? six weeks, my daughter, Catherine, and I was in New Jersey, the interview was in Washington, newborn baby, and of course I didn't tell them I was bringing the baby, but up, you know, she had to eat, right? So, you know, new moms are like lionesses, and she was coming with me, whether they liked it or not. I mean, it was just what's going to happen. And um, I, I remember the morning of the interview, I said, okay, now let me work backwards. I got a 10 o'clock interview, got to take the train with the kid, get to Washington, so I think I got up at something like 3, got on the train, got to Penn Station. It was 103 degrees that day, I remember that. And, you know, some, sometimes in your life the stars align. And I said, you know, take her to, you know, the Acela Lounge. And your, nan your nanny came with she you, She came, right? yes, you know, yes. we had this whole thing worked out. And if one thing had gone wrong, disaster, you know. So <laughs> bribe the guy to let me in the Acela Lounge because I didn't have, you know, privileges to go into the lounge. I got an interview. My kids got to eat. Can I just use So I had, after she, you know, had her little meal, I had exactly two hours to get from Union Station to the Capitol 
interview before she was in, uh, you know, an eight-week-old infant meltdown. You know, and now thinking back, it really was insanity. You know, so, you know, all right, let's go. Rolled her over to the Capitol and, you know, the, you know, the caregiver rolled her up and down the Capitol and I had, you know, probably by this time I had like an hour and 40 minutes left. And so, you know, I just did the best I could. And I remember thinking, oh, you know, my, my strategy was not to embarrass myself because, you know, you're getting about two hours sleep a night and I wasn't at, I didn't think I was at my best, but, you know, I just talked about what I knew. And it ended up actually being the best interview that I ever had. And I remember when it was over, you know, I stretched a little. I said, you know, I was really at a competitive disadvantage at this interview. I was talking to Senator Daschle's staff. And they said, and why is that, Ms. Harbour? I said, well, because, you know, I have a... Um, I have a seven-week-old infant that's being rolled up and down the hall right outside the doorway, and she's probably going to be hungry in about ten minutes. What? They said, let's see her. So, you know, I figured when they said that, that, you know, the interview couldn't have been that bad. And so, uh, you know, after that, um, they backed my candidacy, and then... The rest, and the rest is history. Yeah, and, and interestingly, you know, it really is quite a process to get to the commission. Had I known, I might have been daunted and not tried. But, you know, first you have to get the, the nomination from, the, you know, the, the, the Democrats. And I was an independent. So, and then they send you over to the White House and you start the whole process over again. So if you're too liberal and it's a Republican White House, you're going to get the ax. And if you're too conservative, you won't get the Democratic. So, you know, it, it's sort of like Goldilocks. You have to be just right. And having a cute baby with you apparently doesn't hurt either. <laughs> well, you know, they didn't know that. So I thought, so, you know, I'm going through the White House interview and I'm, you know, very substantive and da, da, da. And then at the end, I figured, well, you know, at the end, actually, the White House um, uh, personnel uh, woman who was interviewing me said, you know, Ms. Harbour, I, I have another question to ask you. She said, we heard that you brought your infant to the Dashiell interview. Is that true? And I said, I, uh, yes, it is. And she said, that's cool. <laughs> <laughs> so that was... Uh, that was no, really and I remember story. the first time you told me that story, and from even before that, but for the rest of your term, I always remember that story, and it was a perfect example of the way that you were a mentor and a role model to so many of us who have been struggling to juggle work and family for all these years, so we all very much appreciated ah, it. Well, you're welcome. So we only have about a minute left. We're done. No. Um, we have to say something really fast about music and singing. That's your final word. Okay. What are we saying? You got a minute. Okay. Uh, Tara is a soprano. I'm a soprano. We love to sing. And as my going away sort of gift to myself, because I don't really get to perform a lot, Tara and I sang a duet uh, at my going away party. Which I still can't believe I did. Yeah. There are some days I still can't believe so I did. So are we going to sing? No, we're definitely not going <laughs> to sing. But I felt like we had, to, we had to record the fact that that happened somewhere. Okay, so that and the phenomenal Castor Gear. We had oh, the, the, phenom the Castor Gear that. performance, too. So um, I think a big part of your legacy as a commissioner, whether you like it or not, is you were the musical commissioner. I, we were music majors. I was Tara's musical. So anyway. You, you're pretty musical, too. Yeah. Well, um, this has been really fun. And um, I, I think it's a great way to capture uh, someone who has been really influential to the Anatrust Bar. Um, to morale at the FTC. Um, you were just wonderful for morale there and, and, and making people feel valued and special. And, ah. um, and some, some days you. it's still weird to think that you're not there anymore and that you're in private practice across the street. Well, I but can see the commission from my window. I know. <laughs> but uh, but um, we are all really grateful that we had you there. And, and uh, I, I hope that your new, this next phase of your career is going wonderfully in private practice. Thank you very much. Well, this has been lovely, Pam. Okay. This was fun. Thanks.